Now, let's consider how we actually read and write from uh, and to SRAM cells. So, obviously, the first step is going to be to pre-charge the bit line and bit line bar. And let's assume first that we are pre-charging the bit line and bit line bar to VDD, to, the, to a value of VDD. And let's assume that we are reading from the SRAM cell with a value of 0 volts stored at Q and a value of VDD stored at Q bar. Now, um, the word line is going to be 0 while we are pre-charging, and so the bit lines are going to be floating capacitors that manage to pre-charge up to a value of VDD, and uh, over here we're going to have CBL bar, and over here we're going to have CBL. Now, once pre-charging has been concluded, we can enable the cell by raising uh, the word line. This enables the transistors M5 and M6. What's going to happen now is that uh, CBL is going to discharge through transistors M5 and M1 because M1 is on, and therefore CBL is going to discharge, and CBL bar is going to uh, uh, is going to remain at the same voltage because we have a VDD, a value of VDD on uh, the source or the drain, whatever, and a value of VDD on the other terminal of M6. Now, if we were worried about the fact that we uh, were using only NMOS to create switches instead of transmission gates, we find that we don't need to worry about it because uh, we are not faced with a situation where we need to pass a VDD from one terminal to the other. So in this case, we have a situation where this terminal is VDD, this terminal is VDD, and this terminal is VDD. This transistor M6 is going to be cut off, and this is a uh, valid steady state for uh, this transistor, and CBL bar is going to keep its value of VDD. And therefore, if you want to find out if you are storing a 0 or a 1 on, no on node Q, all you have to do is watch the value of uh, the voltage on CBL uh, and see if it's dropping or not. In fact, uh, one you know, it's, it's, a, it's actually better to look at the differential voltage between CBL and CBL bar, specifically VBL minus VBL bar, and see which direction it's going, if it's going in a positive direction or in a negative direction. And this helps you um, determine if we are storing a 1 or a 0 at node Q. Now, pre-charging the uh, bitline and bitline bar to a value of VDD has a, a disadvantage actually a couple of disadvantages. One of them is that the difference between uh, the bit line and bit line bar is actually being created by a single side of the cell. So all of the effort to discharge or charge the capacitors uh, is being done by M1 and M5 in this case. To be more specific, all of the effort is being done by the side storing zero. The other side just finds itself in a steady state and doesn't need to do any effort. And therefore, to create a certain delta VBL between CBL and CBL bar, we probably have to wait longer because only one side of the cell is making an effort. There's another disadvantage to uh, pre-charging to a value of VDD. So this is a situation uh, uh, where uh, we are storing a 0 at node Q bar and storing a 1 at node uh, Q. So in this situation, we uh, are faced with a uh, problem here because uh, when CBL bar is being discharged, uh, the current that discharges CBL bar is going to leave a resistive drop on M3. And so, therefore, node Q bar is going to rise uh, for a short time, of course, for a transient time, uh, uh, until we manage to fully discharge CBL bar. The problem here is that Q bar is also the input to uh, the other inverters. So, M2 and M1, in this case, are dependent on Q bar to keep them in a specific state. Now, if Q bar rises so much that M2 starts to turn off and M1 starts to turn on, then we are in trouble because the state of the, of the cell can flip. Because if this transistor formed from M1 and M2 starts to switch state, even starts to switch state, what it's going to do is it's going to start a positive feedback loop where it also tells the other uh, inverter to switch state and they will flip states just because we are reading. And we don't want the reading operation to flip the state of the cell. That is not something that we want to see. You can guarantee that this is not going to happen by making sure that the resistance of M3 is relatively small. Spe specifically, it should be relatively small 
relative to the uh, resistance of M6, so that the voltage divider formed be between the two uh, is at worst not going to create a value of VQ bar that is high enough to even start turning M1 on. So if you can guarantee that VQ bar is not going to rise above, let's say, the logic threshold of inverter, uh, of the static inverter, then you can guarantee that flipping is not going to happen. If you can guarantee that VQ bar is, gonna, is not going to rise above V threshold N, then you are even safer because the transistor, uh, the NMOS transistor on the other side, isn't even going to turn on. So you, you start to get into a situation where you have to size the transistors in the cell to guarantee something other than density. And this is not a situation we want to find ourselves in. So what's actually better to do is to pre-charge bit line and bit line bar to uh, a value of VDD over 2. And so we use a uh, value of VDD over 2 at the, drain, at the sources of the pre-charged PMOS transistors instead of VDD. And therefore, when we are pre-charging when phi is equal to 0, uh, we are pre-charging bit line and bit line bar to VDD over 2. And so this is the pre-charge phase. And we are waiting for both bit line and bit line bar to be equal at VDD over 2. And it's really important that these two bit line, the, these two lines are actually at the exact same voltage. So it's very important to wait until they are completely equalized before we start reading operation. So then we turn off the pre-charged transistors by raising phi. And after we, we, we turn off the PMOS transistors, we can turn on uh, the word line at any time. So when we turn on the word line, uh, the two transistors, uh, the two sides of the storage cell are going to actually work to, uh, to discharge and charge the bit line capacitors. So if we look at the waveform again uh, for reading, this is how it looks like. Uh, we have pre-charged to VDD over 2. And then when we enable the word line, the side where we are storing A1 is going to uh, charge the bit line up towards uh, VDD. The side storing a 0 is going to discharge it down towards 0. So the side uh, storing a 1 is going to charge up this uh, bit line through M4 and M6, and the side storing a 0 is going to discharge it through M1 and M5. It's important to notice that on the side storing a 1, we can't actually uh, uh, charge the bit line or bit line bar up to VDD. This is only going to reach VDD over 2. Uh, but if you look at the difference between bit line and bit line bar, the delta between VBL and VBL bar, now this delta is being created by two lines instead of one line, and therefore this delta is going to grow faster than if we were just depending on a single transistor to uh, create uh, a single side to create all the difference. The other thing is we start from VDD over 2 here, and therefore uh, there's re there isn't really as much current as there was uh, in the case where we pre-charge to VDD, and therefore the amount of bounce that we see on the side storing 0 or the amount of drop that we see on the side storing 1 is not high enough uh, to uh, flip the state of the cell. And therefore we are not really going to worry as much about sizing the cell as we would have if we were, we were pre-charging up to VDD. Now we still have to answer for the fact that this is never going to reach VDD. This is going to reach 0 volt, but this is only going to reach up to VDD minus V threshold. But we will talk more about this when we uh, consider timing in, in, in the read operation. Now, let's just look at how we write uh, to the uh, SRAM cell. So uh, there are two cases when writing. Either we are writing the same data that was there, and that's a trivial case, so we don't, wanna, uh, we don't need to worry about it, or we are trying to flip the state of the cell. So that this is the case where we uh, which we care about. So let's consider the case where we were storing VDD at Q and zero volt at Q bar, and we need to write new data to this. So when you need to write new data, what you're going to do is you're going to drive the values that you want to write using drive buffers on the, uh, on the bit lines. And it's important to understand that the bit lines while reading are completely different from the bit lines when writing. It's the same metal line, but it is completely different in terms of its impedance. When we are reading, the bit line and bit line bar are uh, left at high impedance, and they are left at the mercy of uh, the cells. And so when we look at this situation, the cells themselves are the drivers, 
and the bit line and bit line capacitance are just responding to it. But while we are writing, we actually have to drive the values on bit line and bit line bar from low impedance, and therefore they have to be drive buffers that provide a very low impedance. Uh, strong drive to a specific value and therefore we are actually driving a value of zero volt out of a very low impedance drive buffer and a value of VDD out of a very low impedance drive buffer and we are going to discuss how these drive buffers are designed later although they are actually just inverter chains. Now what's going to happen is that this drive buffer on the side storing zero is going to sink a lot of current and this is are gonna cause the value of Q bar, VQ bar to drop because we are sinking current and thus leaving a drop on the resistance of M5. On the other side, the drive buffer is gonna source a lot of current, leaving a high drop on M3. This will raise the value of VQ bar and will drop the value of VQ. And therefore, because these two voltages are moving uh, against each other and against this, the values that were already stored there, we are going to flip the cell. This is going to happen because VQ bar is rising, so it starts to turn off M2. Simultaneously, it starts to turn on M1. While VQ is dropping, which starts to turn off M3 and starts to turn on M4. Now, what's going to happen is that as soon as M3 starts to turn off and M2 starts to turn off, M1 starts to turn on and M4 starts to turn on, the cell itself will take care of a lot of the writing. So the cell itself is going to take care of flipping its own state because it only, we only need to surpass the, thresh, the logic threshold voltage of one of the inverters in order to flip the state of the cell. So these buffers don't actually need to drive VQ and VQ bar all the way to VDD and zero volt. They just need to press them beyond VM, which is the uh, inverter logic threshold. And then these two inverters connected in positive feedback are gonna take care of flipping their own state. We'll discuss this again in more detail when we discuss sense amplifiers because they have a very similar structure to, a, uh, uh, to an inverter pair connected in positive feedback. Now, there's a strong contradiction in the design of SRAM cells. SRAM cells have bad area to begin with because they contain a very large number of transistors. Now, we have a problem here because we want to increase density and we cannot reduce the number of transistors below six. So uh, what we can do is we can make the transistor small. But while we're reading, we have to charge and discharge CBL and CBL bar through the series resistance of M6 and M3 or M5 and M1 or you know uh, through the series resistance of a PMOS and an NMOS, which is a, not a small resistance. And therefore, the cells, which are sized to be small, cannot provide enough current to create the delta VBL that we need within a good read time. This is a fundamental problem with all memory arrays. You need to make the cells small so that you promote density, but you need to make the cells large because they are supposed to drive the capacitance of the entire bit line while reading, and that capacitance is huge. So how can we resolve this? We resolve it using sense amplifiers, which we will discuss in the next video.